first conversation with Prabhupada was after the park. Uh, Prabhupada and the devotees rolled up the rug and left the park. And I had never heard of Hare Krishna before. It wasn't a popular thing as it is now. And some stranger came over to me and asked me if I'd like to go to the temple to see the Swami. And I didn't know what that was, but I intuitively felt there was something there. And so I went to the temple, and the first thing I saw, besides the devotees chanting in front of Prabhupada's, what they called the dais at that time, his Vyasasana, um, two devotees, one devotee came over and gave me a japati, which I immediately started eating. And while I was eating it, two other devotees were talking um, between themselves, and I overheard. And one of them was saying, the Swami just said that whenever devotees fight, it should be taken like clouds passing by. Because when clouds pass by, you hardly even notice it, or you don't notice it. So it should be taken as insignificant. And I thought that was pretty amazing, especially since at that time it was the Vietnam War and so many protests and everything was in turmoil. So I thought it was amazing. And then somebody asked, invited me to come up to see the Swami in his apartment. So um, I went there and there were about 10 or 15 devotees chanting Japa, although I didn't know what they were chanting. And then Prabhupada was sitting in front of his little oval altar, which you saw in the Livamrita, which is surrounded by the tall gladiola plants. And he offered his obeisances to one of the pictures of Krishna on the altar. And I was an impersonalist, and so I thought he was offering his obeisances to the floor because everything is God. And then he went into his back room, which was called the greeting room or the sitting room, and uh, somebody asked me to go back there. So um, I didn't know anything. I was just following the requests. And in that room, I noticed that Prabhupada was um, reciprocating with everybody as they reciprocated with him. Whoever shook his hand, he shook their hand. Whoever uh, did that, he did that. As they did with him, he was with them. With them. Um, so then he said to me, um, he said to everyone actually, he said, he sat back, he was sitting on his mat, and he sat back and he said, we are eternal and everything around us is temporary. And uh, because he is the uh, external manifestation of super soul, you feel the power of the super soul speaking, and so it had a tremendous influ influence, just that statement. And then uh, he asked me if I live nearby, and I said, oh yes, I live very near, because I thought I was all-pervading. But actually, I lived an hour and a half away. And so he said, oh, very good, then you can come for morning classes. And although it would be very difficult, especially taking an hour and a half train ride from the Bronx to downtown Manhattan, by the power of his in invitation, I felt obligated to do it, and I began taking the train in the mornings. So that was my first experience with him. So I went into the temple and I noticed that there were uh, lots of pots because the engagement was right after lunch and usually somebody brings the pots upstairs back to Prabhupada's quarters and washes them, but this time it was a rush. So I offered to bring the pots up to the apartment and when I got up there, Achyutananda, who was in the kitchen, said, you know, you're not supposed to be up here unless you're initiated. So I was so embarrassed and so flustered, I didn't know what to do. And I noticed out of the corner of my eye that in Prabhupada's greeting room, he was sitting there. So I didn't know what to say, so I just turned to Prabhupada and said, I didn't mean to say it, but I said, oh, yes, yeah, so that's what I came up to talk to you about, initiation. So he was very calm and serene about it. And he said, uh, can you follow the principles? And I said yes, although at that time I only had given up smoking. But I said, yes, I could do it. And um, he said, all right, you can be initiated in two weeks with Bob. And then uh, the day before initiation, um, I didn't have any beads yet, <laughs> so I was streaking beads. 
Um, see, in those days we didn't have Tulsi, so we would all buy these red beads at Tandy's um, hobby store and string them ourselves. And I was asking some of the devotees what was the meaning of initiation, and they were saying, <laughs> they were saying, uh, it means that you agree to serve the spiritual master, you accept him as God, and you agree to serve him for the rest of this life and eternally thereafter. Oh, okay. And then I thought I would dress for the occasion, since it was a special occasion, so I wore my tight black jeans and black turtleneck shirt. Uh, then at the initiation ceremony, I didn't know Prabhupada's pranam mantra yet. So when he handed me the beads and told me to bow down, I didn't know what to say about being bowed down. So he said Nama, and then I said Nama, and he said Om, I said Om, he said Vishnu Padaya. And then that way we went through the mantra. And then he said, uh, your name is Jadarani. And Jadarani is the original queen in the Jadu dynasty. And Krishna appears in a particular family although he is eternal, to glorify that family of devotees. And he appears just like the sun. The sun is always there, but it appears in the day and disappears at night. So Krishna appeared like that. Um, so I was honored to get the name. Uh, one analogy he gave was um, uh, 1906 or uh, 66 or 67, he began his Prahlad Maharaj series, when Prahlad would speak to his classmates when his teachers were out. And one example was about, um, in an airplane, you have a driver and a motor. Without the motor, the plane doesn't run. And without the driver, even with the motor, the plane doesn't run. So without the soul and the body, even if you have all the mechanical arrangements, the body doesn't work. And then he said, if you take a teeny drop of poison, like tomain poison, even though the body is so big and so complicated, if you put one small drop of tomain poisoning in it, life is finished. So why not, if you have a little tiny soul, one ten thousandth of the tip of the hair, if that's in the body, it brings the whole body to life. Well, after a couple of paintings where the proportions were wrong, he taught me a system. He gave me some instructions on how to make the painting more accurate. And um, that was called the grid system. And he taught me about, say, the pictures in the glass. The picture always that he gave me was in a frame with glass. So you, uh, with some kind of marker or a paintbrush, you divide the picture in half, and then that, those two in half, and those two in half. So you get 16 lines across and 16 lines down. And uh, so I would, instead of trying to do the whole picture at once, you just do one box at a time. And that's how it came out more accurate. And the first painting I did like that was a painting of his Guru Maharaj, which he gave me. And uh, he had a little bit long hair and a beard also. And I was surprised because Prabhupada was a spiritual master and he was clean shaven. So he told me that for four months of the year called Chaturmasya, where devotees did austerity, he didn't shave at that time. And uh, that was the painting I did. And he was very tolerant with my um, lack of any kind of consciousness, what to speak of Krishna consciousness. It was a very old picture, you can imagine, if it was a picture of his Guru Maharaj. And so the, the details weren't clear. So in my painting, I didn't paint fingernails. And he brought it to my attention. I said, well, I didn't see them. Dumb, a dumb answer. And he said, all right. As you know, like I was saying something very intelligent. <laughs> but everybody knows what fingernails look like. So he, he was very, uh, very patient and tolerant. But then, of course, I realized that I should put them on. And then... Um, as the painting was coming to an end, um, I painted white tilak because the picture was black and white. And our tilak was also white because there was no Gopi Chandan at that time. So we all used Fuller's Earth, <coughs> which one of the devotees bought at some hardware store. And so he told me to make the tilak yellowish and also to make a bright garland. 
and uh, not to put a halo around him. Perhaps I'd already put one, and he said not to put one. And then on a small piece of paper, which subsequently he did for many paintings after that, he would write in his own handwriting on a small, long piece of paper the mantra of that particular painting. So he wrote the pranam mantra of his Guru Maharaj and told me to write that at the bottom. And then when it was completely finished, he made a big announcement. There was maybe 10 devotees in, the, in his room, and he said, you have brought me Vaikuntha. <laughs> Although he had brought us Vaikuntha, he said that. Sometimes Prabhupada would come over when I would paint and give other instructions. He, he'd squat in that typical Indian way and give instructions like um, make the palms pink or um, make something else some other way. He'd come and kneel and give instructions. Or sometimes he would just come by and look, and I would just ask him philosophical questions. Like, for example, he'd be lecturing about um, how the goddess of fortune was born out of the churning of the milk ocean. Now, that's pretty far out. So uh, I'd, see, I'd see him standing there behind me as I was painting, and I'd just turn around and say, how could that have happened? So Prabhupada said, you should just think, all right, I don't understand something now. He explained it a little bit, but still it's beyond the mind. So he said, you should just think, all right, I don't understand now, but later on the understanding will come. Prabhupada's philosophy came to us in waves because he would speak every morning and every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday evenings. And then we would meet him on so many other occasions, particularly after I began painting in his quarters. There was lots of interaction, and we heard not only from him instructions, but the other devotees. We would all repeat him as soon as we heard an instruction. Um, but because we were dull, the, even we would hear so many things, they registered in their own time. Um, once I heard from the devotees that we couldn't um, lick stamps or um, lick envelopes. And so I asked Prabhupada, I heard this, and uh, why is that? Why do you say that the mouth is a dirty place? So he said, well, so many things are always coming and going. It's one of the nine gates of the body, and so it's considered a dirty place. Another time I was, um, I used to clean the altar room before I started painting. And um, in April, uh, Prabhupada had Govindadasi and Gursundar introduce the first, uh, the second Iskan Arti. First, they started in San Francisco, which was simply a large tray with a small Jewish votive candle with the Hebrew letters still on the glass. So the first person on the line, there was a line of devotees in front of the Sankirtan painting, the not Sankirtan but the Panchatattva, standing with Lord Chaitanya and his four associates. That was on the side altar. And Prabhupada would sit on his dais. Um, in the front. So the devotees would take turns um, offering the arti, one minute each devotee, and pass it on to the next one in line. Then after the program, uh, somebody brought the candle up to the altar room, and I would clean the altar room. So one day, the candle was all the way down at the bottom, and I shook it, and I put a piece of paper over it, I put my hand over it, I waved over it, and the... And the um, candle wouldn't go out. So Prabhupada was standing by, by the candle, and he said, why don't you blow on it? So I said, well, I thought we're not supposed to blow on anything. So he said, when there's no other alternative, and it's all right. Then I kept cleaning, and my leg brushed against these tall gladiola plants that he had um, around his oval altar. And I turned to him and said, um, I just touched the plant with my leg. Should I offer obeisances? Because it was the plant's of the altar. And he said, yes. Prabhupada uh, called me into his room in 1967 in New York. The devotees from Boston, and I was one of them, came down to see him. And after his darshan, he called me in and handed me one print, about that big, of Radha and Krishna and the eight gopis. And he asked me to make a big canvas of that really big, like four feet by five feet. And he began explaining from the Brahma Samhita how, um, we didn't know the Brahma Samhita then, but how the, um, 
palaces are all made of touchstones and the cows give nectar-like milk that fulfill everyone's desire and the ground is muddy with the milk of the cows and the trees are wish-fulfilling trees that supply all eatables upon anyone's demand. And the gopis, they, the associates of Radharani, they serve Radharani and Krishna by fanning them and singing and dancing and offering them foodstuffs. So I couldn't relate that much to the exalted description, but as I was looking at the um, print, my only response to all that beauty, beautiful words, was, how come the gopis aren't looking at Radha and Krishna? Shouldn't they be looking? Because they're looking in different ways, holding their serving paraphernalia. So Prabhupada said, when you're dancing, you don't always have to look. And then um, he told me to make um, Krishna a little bit smaller. He said, Krishna looks a little fatty there, fatty, and he's too tall, so make him a little thinner and shorter. And then uh, I said, those flowers there, they're all blobs, because the artist hadn't made uh, details. What flowers should I put there? So he said, you can take any flower and transport it to Vrindavan. And then um, I said, I heard that Krishna's eyes are red. Sometimes we hear the red lotus eyes. So he said, red dish. Then he said, reddish black. And then I, I asked him, well, you say that Krishna is the color of a fresh rain cloud, but what color exactly is that? So Prabhupada um, uh, started, he lowered his head, and then he put his hand up on his head like this, and he gradually brought his head up and his hand down, and then by the time his hand was like this, he said, they say Krishna is the color of a fresh rain cloud, but I do not know what color that is which, you know, in his great humility, he showed that he really knows not only from scripture but from realization. One amazing thing about him is that, just like if I'm looking at your camera here, I don't have to be very intelligent to describe your camera. It's black and it has these legs on it and it's made of metal because I'm seeing it for what it is and I'm an ordinary person. So with Prabhupada, um, even an ordinary person could look at him and hear him say simple things or give simple gestures and get great realizations about the nature of a pure devotee because he emanated the truths about him. It was emanated just by his glance or his words. So just by him saying that, you could feel that he um, can see Krishna. I notice, I do it myself and I hear everybody else do it who had any experience with Prabhupada. When they would talk about some conversation that they had with him, they said, and he looked at me and said, or, and he looked at me slowly and said, or he looked at me quickly and said. And nobody says that when they're talking about somebody. They just said, the person says. So it meant that if Prabhupada just casually or in any way looked at us even quickly, it had tremendous significance. Um, so I felt very similar to other devotees, that he wasn't just seeing my dress as this body, but he was seeing the soul inside. Um, and he was seeing me, although I couldn't see me, and it was almost embarrassing. But it was, it was not embarrassing in the sense if, if you know that somebody knows all your faults, and they look at you, and you know they know, it's embarrassing. But this was beyond that, because you knew that not only was he seeing beyond the body, but he was seeing beyond the faults and beyond the interactions of the modes of nature and all the coverings. But he was seeing the soul proper, which was so full of wonderful qualities. So it was embarrassing and then beyond embarrassing, just blissful when he would glance. And um, like we hear stories of Krishna when he would take um, lunch with his coward boys and everybody would be thinking that, well, he's just looking at me and it's just me and him. And that's how it was with so many of us with Prabhupada. If you have ten people in the room with him, they'll each have a personal story of the same moments. <laughs> so um, there were a few experiences that I had with Prabhupada's glance, uh, that one that I just mentioned. And then another one, 
I had just finished uh, the painting, my very first painting of Radha and Krishna and the cow, which he told me to copy from the, the cover of the Bhagavatam that he brought from India. So that was hanging in his, um, in his altar room, and he called me into his greeting room because some young men, young gentlemen, Indians, had come to speak with him. And he offered them a, some kind of maha sweet. And before they ate it, they put it to their head. And we had never done that before. So he glanced at me and carried me, <laughs> my eyes, over to them. And so I watched them and saw how he was indicating that we should be respectful to Prashadam. And he said, but you just keep hearing. It doesn't matter what your material qualification or disqualification is. Just keep hearing submissively, and everything will come, and God will become fully realized to you. And we had that faith. Um, and he would give many arguments defeating the Mayavadis, which helped me tremendously. Like the Mayavadis say, um, you become silent. Now you're talking so much, but when you become self-realize you become God and you become silent. And they give the example of a water jug. When you're filling it up, it goes gurgle, gurgle, gurgle. And then when it's full, it's silent. So he said the Mayavadis give this kind of argument, but if they're giving an analogy, analogy means that there are many similar points, but there's no similar point here. Because is the living entity a water jug? Am I, can I be compared to a water jug? Uh, he said, in the scriptures, it says, Atato Brahma Jigasam. Now real talking begins. Now that you've passed through all the lower species and come to human life, now it's time to talk about the human subjects. Or he'd say that the Mayavadis say that, um, I'm God. So I would say to him, Oh, you're God? How you have become dog? Well, I'm God, but I've just forgotten. Okay, you may be that, you may be God, but you're not that God that doesn't forget. So in this way, he would play both sides. Um, and then uh, Purushottam and I worked in Prabhupada's quarters. Achyutananda did also, but he worked in the kitchen. And uh, Purushottam would be cleaning and I would be painting. So after class and after the breakfast, he'd come into the altar room where we worked and he'd say, okay, what did I say in class? And I would say, well, uh, God is everything, but everything is not God, or is it that Everything is God, but God is not. And then he would continue speaking. And he would say, the greatest illusion is to think that I'm God. And LSD is the greatest, greatest illusion because it puts you in that foolish frame of mind. So we got the lectures and his personal discussions and hearing from uh, all the devotees. And I mean, he even instructed me one time because um, he would wash his laundry in, the, in his bathtub and the devotees who lived downstairs, they also did that. And Prabhupada instructed me one day when I came up to paint, don't use washing machines. They're not nice. So little instructions here and there. It was in the early 70s, and we were not only painting Krishna then, but we were painting for the Bhagavatam. So there are many incarnations. Now, Krishna is very distinctive. He's blue, and he wears a peacock feather, and he has a yellow dhoti. So even if it's a bad painting, you know that's Krishna. Um, but then there are kings, like King Prithu, who is a general-looking king, as far as we know. He has a mustache. Prabhupada told us just how to paint kings, how to paint sages, like kings have no beard but only a small mustache. And... Uh, we couldn't even imagine that a king could be a Vaishnava because we thought that only if you were a dhoti, then, you ha then you're a Vaishnava. But he said kings with helmets were also Vaishnavas. So descriptions of kings like King Prithu or ladies, Brahminical ladies like Mother Sachi, was general. There can be many Brahmin ladies who look like that. So I wrote to Prabhupada and asked, um, it's easy to understand that Krishna is in his picture because he is distinctive. But when you have somebody like King Prithu or Sachi Mata, how are they in their pictures? So Prabhupada wrote back that um, they are present by your consciousness. That is, if, if we're thinking that it's them and we're painting 
not by concoction, but from his authorized instructions, and especially if it's in his book, then they're actually present. So many. Sometimes we learn instructions in a positive way like that, and sometimes we learn in a negative way. Negative way means by the uh, school of hard knocks. For example, um, in the early 70s, I did a painting for the cover of Adi Lila Volume 3 of the uh, Lord Chaitanya Sankirtan party coming to the house of Chan Kazi. And I had Lord Nityananda playing a murdanga, and I painted it all in. And then I asked him, is that all right? And he said, he doesn't play a murdanga. And, um, and then I had to ask him so many questions that if I was a normal reader of his books, a normal, even a normal devotee reader, I wouldn't have thought to ask. But because we had to do so many details, and not all the details were in the manuscript, we had to ask him so many questions. What does Ramananda Rai look like? How old is he? Did he have hair? Was he sannyasi? So many questions about so many of Krishna's associates and Lord Chaitanya's associates. And he would patiently answer hundreds and hundreds of questions. So Rabhavan Bhattacharya is such and such years old, and Ramananda Rai is in his 40s. One question, so-and-so wears a saffron dhoti. So, so many instructions like that. Um, and uh, I asked about Lord Chaitanya's, uh, Lord Nityananda's sannyas, and Prabhupada said he never took sannyas, so we knew then not to paint him the same way we'd paint Lord, Nit- Lord Chaitanya as sannyasi. Um, in the original Krishna book, um, Prabhupada used Devahuti Prabhu's painting of Ras Lila, which she had copied from an Indian print. Very, not so realistic, a little stylistic, but very dignified, very nice. And then I thought, uh, we were doing the third canto, and there was another description of the Rasalila. So I thought, well, surely I'll make a more realistic one than Devahuti did, with proper lighting and realistic folds of the cloth. And this will be so much better than Devahuti's. So we went through a great endeavor. Merle Varana was the BBT photographer at that time. And we took about 10 or 15 devotees in a van to uh, some park, big park in New York. And the devotees posed for the Rasa dance. And the, the girls had their hair long, and Krishna has his hair long. And moving around, things were flowing, as we would imagine they would have been if they were dancing. And then um, Merle Vadana took the pictures, and it went in the book. And when Prabhupada saw the Bhagavatam, he said, this ruined my whole book. <laughs> he said, this, you have made it like a hippie plaything, and Jadarani is a hippie rascal. Um, he said, Devahudis was w- much more dignified. The Ras Lila is Krishna's smiling face. You know, the different cantos go up his body. Smiling face. And you have uh, made it just like a plaything. So in that way, we got that kind of instruction in a negative way. For the Chaitanya Charitamrita marathon, we asked him maybe a thousand questions, many, many letters. Not only letters, but um, because Prabhupada was traveling around the world, and you have a two-month marathon, and each book has to come out in a week, you can't start writing to India and wait for the letters back. So sometimes Ramaswara would call in the questions and ask Paramahamsa, Swami, who was Prabhupada's secretary, he would ask Prabhupada the questions, call Ramaswara back, and then Ramaswara would bring the messages back to us. Sometimes I would write the questions in my handwriting, and um, somebody would be going to India, like Nitai would be going to India to bring one of the volumes to show Prabhupada that it was already published. And then Prabhupada would give the answers, and they would write a one or two word answer in between my handwritten lines. And that would come back by another devotee who had just come back from India. So everything was going very fast. And we'd ask him maybe a thousand questions at that time. But now in 69, we asked some questions for each painting. So 
Prabhupada was very encouraging and he said, if you discuss it amongst sel- yourselves and use your discretion, that will be better than asking me. In the same letter, he answered one of our questions to show that asking Prabhupada is better than using our own discretion. And that is, we were doing the painting of Krishna fighting with Jamavan. Now in the Krishna book, Jamavan is addressed as the king of the gorillas and also as Riksharaj, which means king of the bears. So the question was, is Jamavan a gorilla or a bear? And Prabhupada answered back that um, he's neither a gorilla nor a bear. Um, just like somebody may be named Krishna Das or Krishna, but that doesn't mean that he's Krishna. <laughs> so he may be called the king of the bears or gorillas, but that doesn't mean he's a gorilla. Otherwise, how could his daughter Jambavati have been beautiful enough to become Krishna's wife? Then he said, he was like a big, strong man of your country. Um, So in this way, we got further instructions about Krishna consciousness through Krishna consciousness also in our knowledge that we're fully dependent on Prabhupada to know anything. Twice I wrote to him, and I asked him if I could just be a Sankirtan devotee. And twice he wrote back, no, that... uh, your specific talent is painting, so you should do that. But um, even in spiritual life, variety makes one more fit for work, so you can go on Sankirtan sometimes. Then, in 1974, when Prabhupada was making so many letters of glorification to the book distributors, I also started feeling really left out. You know, he would say that just two devotees, he wrote one letter, I think, to the Chicago temple that only two devotees, and at that time devotees meant there were 150 devotees in a temple, only two devotees should stay back and take care of the deities, and everyone else should go out on book distribution, everyone should go out all day and then come back for one meal a day, and um, right or wrong, I never questioned my spiritual master, and he always stressed this book distribution, so I was pretty glum. And at that time again, I wrote to him and asked if we could do that, and he said, just because I write something to one person, it doesn't mean that it's the same for everybody. Making pictures for the books is the same as distributing them. So he always rejected my proposals. Once in Boston, he was telling me something, something brilliant. Um, I was sitting in his darshan room, and I said, Gee, Swamiji, you know everything. So he said, unless one knows everything, how can he be a teacher? <laughs> and then another time he was saying something brilliant, and I said the same thing. You know everything. So he put his head down and he said, I have done nothing extraordinary. I am simply a canvasser for the disciplic succession. <laughs> An example of his humility was um, when I was painting Lord Nishingadev, as I mentioned, that little picture, maybe two by three, didn't have details, but I did notice that it had a rug at the bottom. Lord Nishingadev and Ananta were both on an Indian rug. And I needed a reference for an Indian rug. I remember that there was a print of um, Sita, Ram, and Hanuman on Prabhupada's wall. Suppose I'm Prabhupada. And the picture was behind him up on the wall, and he was sitting on his mat. So he was working in the next room, so I very quietly tiptoed in not to bother him. And I wanted to look at the print, but it was a little far away unless I would step on Prabhupada's mat. I didn't want to step on the mat, so I was in front of the mat. But to see the picture good, I had to kind of like jump up and down. So Prabhupada looked at me, you know, what are you doing? So I said, well, I'm trying to see this picture as a reference for my painting, but I didn't want to step on your bed, because he not only used it as a daytime mat for sitting on, but he also slept on it at night. So he just said, in Krishna's service, you can step on my head. And you can tell that was his whole, his whole frame of being, that he's willing to sacrifice anything to help others come to Krishna. 
Choose. 